supposed to recognize that they follow Jehovah, that they follow the Lord. Really, it's in the same manner that people are supposed to know that we follow Jesus. And truly, it boils down to two things that we kind of pull out of the, um, the Gospels. First, Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, If you love me, obey my commandments. So we see a portion of that as obedience. And the second, still talking to the disciples, people will know who you are by the way you love one another. The section of laws that we're going to be in today is going to be broken down essentially into a few different groups. Um, the first section we're going to be in is how they were supposed to treat one another's property. The second section is how they're supposed to be treating one another. In the third section, we're going to move into some of the more judicial pieces, but also, I guess, right before that, is how they honor God. And they've got a great deal of laws, as we saw starting last week. Um, they're kind of expounding on what we were given in the Ten Commandments of chapter 20. We're seeing kind of um, all of these other laws kind of breaking out of that. Uh to give us a little more detail and a little more insight. Why do they need those? Why do they need such intricate laws? Have you ever really thought about that? There's a lot of there's a lot of very specific stuff in here. In fact, if you go through our own history, if you just go home and you get on the internet and you look at uh, weird laws that are still in effect in some states, there is some stuff. It is worth the read. There's some inter interesting laws that are still in effect that you didn't even know you could get a ticket for. But essentially, they're dealing with three different things that are that they're called to be set apart from. You have to remember, they just came out of 400 years of bondage in Egypt with their particular kinds of laws and cultural habits. They're going to be going into the Promised Land, into Canaan, the Canaanites and the Hittites, which are kind of the, the bigger, kind of the, the, the big dog at the park right now, they have their own way of doing things. And largely coming out of Mesopotamia at about the same time is the Code of Hammurabi. And he had his own specific set of laws. So last week we kind of dealt with um, the hard topics of slavery. This week we're dealing with theft and how some people end up being sold as basically an indentured servant. It generally seems very harsh. Some of, especially some of the laws that we went through last week. But when you compare it to how the Egyptians, the Canaanites, or the Mesopotamians, I don't know if I mentioned that one, the Hammurabi, uh, the code of Hammurabi come out of Mesopotamia, how they would do business is you have your offense and you have your capital punishment for a great deal of things. So that's essentially what we're going to be breaking into this evening. So we're going to pick up in chapter 22, verse 1. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He, the thief, should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox or a donkey or sheep, it shall he shall restore double. So the first thing we're dealing with is theft. The first section we're in is how we should be dealing with other people and their property. Especially a big deal here. It's also really important to keep in context. A lot of these laws don't really make sense yet. In verse 2, talking about the thief is found breaking in. The literal rending of that was he's found like he's stuck. He's essentially um, trying to dig through the wall to get into the house. They don't have those kind of walls. This is more of like one of those adobe mud homes that we typically see in Southern California or Arizona from a long time ago. That's what they built their houses out of. So he's trying to climb through the wall and he gets stuck. They're not in those kind of walls. Right now they're in tents, so a lot of these are going to apply largely, you know, when they're moving into the promised land. So first off, a man steals the ox or a sheep, he slaughters it or sells it, it shows malicious intent. 
he'll have to restore five oxen for an ox or four sheep for a sheep. We're seeing a heavier penalty for the thief essentially messing with somebody's livelihood. So it would be restored um, to a much larger portion to the original owner and certainly something to encourage the thief not to steal something. Because if he's stealing it and he gets caught and now he has to repay it, he's losing quite a bit more out of his stock in the event that he doesn't have that. That brings us back to chapter 21. You remember last we were talking about, you know, why would you buy a Hebrew? Selling people in slavery, that's so bad. We talked about one, they were poor and they didn't have the money to, to pay off a debt. So they would work for six years and have and be released the seventh year or if they were caught stealing. So if he got caught and he already killed the animal or sold the animal and he had to restore either the five oxen for an ox or four sheep for a sheep and he didn't have, let's say, the five oxen, what would he have to do? He would have to work that debt off in the next six years. If he's found breaking in, and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him. So we're seeing two different events. The first one is if he's coming in at night and you kill him, it is what it is. Why is that? Why have that stark contrast between night and day? At night, you don't have really any people around you and you can't identify intent. Is he there to steal something? Is he there to harm my family? Is it just him? Is he armed? You can't really identify these things. So if you kill the thief at night, there's not going to be, um, there's no guilt for his bloodshed. But if the sun has risen on him, so we see a difference. If a thief comes in the middle of the daytime, the general idea is, and again, this is kind of laws to direct judges. We identified that one quite a bit last week. We just talked about eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. These are, these are for judges not for the own, like the, the individual kind of making the laws as they go. So if he comes in during the day, you can call for help. You can identify what kind of threat it is. So there will be guilt if you kill him. But if he can't make full restitution, he's going to be working off that debt. If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. That makes sense. Now, I don't really pay attention to cattle ranch stuff because I'm not a cattle person, rancher, farmer, whatever. But we have fences. We have very clear, generally, borders that keep livestock where they're supposed to be. They didn't have these. So even when they went into the promised land, do we remember how they marked their boundaries? It was a rock pile. So you'd have a rock pile on one end of your property, maybe another little rock pile in the middle and a rock pile at the other side. That's the boundary. So if you have your animals kind of free grazing on your land and they trespass into your neighbor's property and start grazing in their land, should the neighbor not be too keen on that idea, he would require you to pull the best from your stock and put it into his. So we see essentially the guilt of carelessness. So not just the concept of being diligent with your own stuff, but being diligent with your what's happening with your neighbors as well. Kind of a fascinating concept. If a fire breaks out and catches in thorns, so that stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Whether it's vandalism or carelessness, we, how many times have we seen someone trying to burn weeds and it just gets out of hand? Happens a lot. We actually see it quite a bit in our region. So whether it's vandalism or carelessness or an accident, if you accidentally set your neighbor's land on fire, you need to be making restitution. Those laws are just interesting ones because it points out the concept of carelessness, guilt because of carelessness, refusing to be diligent, not just with your own stuff, but again, with your neighbor stuff, kind of reinforcing that concept. Remember, Jesus was asked in the Gospel of Matthew, 
what, are, what is the, the greatest law? What is the greatest commandment? And one of those is love your neighbor as you love yourself. We've had great neighbors and we've had bad neighbors. How much more peace of mind do you have when you know that your neighbors have your best interest in mind and you theirs? It certainly changes the, the, the dynamic of a neighborhood. If a man, verse 7, delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he, the thief, shall pay double. And again, if he can't pay at all, that's when he goes into servitude. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges, same word, Elohim, that we discussed last week, to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. So we have, what's the situation? Someone's leaving town, so they're going to put certain things into their neighbor's house for them to watch, things that we have done. If that thing is stolen, they're kind of going through those lists at this point. This one almost kind of sounds, I don't know, like maybe one of those ridiculous things, but we've kind of had that one happen. We've had it happen. We were keeping my buddy's truck in my garage while we were in Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan with my buddy and Megan was an Idaho with her family. Somebody broke into the house, put all my stuff in his truck and then drove off. The situation was made really easy <laughs> because he crashed a truck trying to get away from the cops. But this is a, basically the situation that we're dealing with. So if the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hands into his neighbor's goods to see if it was the master of the house that kind of snuck it away. Going to wait for the situation to calm down a little bit and then the neighbor's goods we moved into his own. For any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. For us, again, we're kind of removed from the situation um, culturally and chronologically. We're very separated from when this is taking place. So it's really important for us to kind of put ourselves into their position. What is it that they're rendering to the neighbor for safekeeping? Livelihood, in the case of something to eat, or, I don't really know a better way to put it, but equipment. So their oxen, things of the nature, you can replace that with, you know, a tractor or tools, things they needed to cultivate the land, things they needed to work the land, things they needed to eat on. So at that point, you can kind of see why it's such a big deal. If a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one seeing it, then an oath of the Lord shall be between them both, that he has not put his hand into his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. But if in fact it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to the owner of it. Again, him kind of putting his hand into the, the honey jar. If it is torn to pieces by a beast, then he shall bring it as evidence, and he shall not make good what was torn. If he finds the carcass and it was taken by an, um, a beast, something carnivorous, he's to bring the remnant back for the original owner and for the judges showing that, hey, this wasn't my fault, an animal got a hold of it, then the situation is resolved. And if a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make it good. If its owner was with it, he shall not make it good. If it was hired, it came for its hire. The difference here is if the owner is on scene and something is happening to his animal that would cause the borrower to make restitution, it's assumed that the owner should have been able to do or would have been able to do something to stop it, i.e. I'm not really a big fan of loaning out power tools. They don't come back or they get dropped or they mistreat it. There's, there's a lot of dumb things you can do with a power tool. If I'm there and I have loaned someone a tool and I can see that they're clearly not using it right, how many people know the different settings on a hammer drill? Like 
those settings are important. Speed settings, hammer settings, the whole works. If you can see he's doing something, he's like, you know what, you're gonna burn up the motor on my drill. And I just let it happen. Oh, joke's on Kyle. He's about to owe me a new drill. That is not loving your neighbor. When you have the ability to intervene, it's like, hey, come on, man. Obviously, you can't do it that way. Or a chainsaw or whatever. If so, if the owner is there and could have done something about it but did not, the borrower does not have to make any kind of restitution. If the owner is not there, then the borrower would have to. And it goes in verse 15, if it's, sorry, if it was hired, it came for its hire or the risk of the loss. So the price of what it would be if it was lost is included in the rental price, essentially. So verse 16, we're moving from that relationship and those laws dealing with people and their property to people. If a man entices a virgin, that word meaning unmarried, uh, it's a young woman assumed to be a virgin. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. So we can see from the beginning, no such thing as casual sex. If a young man or any man entices the young woman and lies with her, he has to pay the bride price. They are to be married. That's what the text is telling us. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of the virgins. So if the young man or man in general entices the woman, lies with her, and he has to pay the bride price, she would go to him to be his wife. And he still has to pay basically the dowry. However, if the father does not like that dude, he can refuse to give his daughter to that individual. However, the one that had li lame? Lame? Is that the word I'm looking for? This doesn't sound right. The one who had lame and would have received the wife will not receive her, but still has to pay forward the dowry. So you can really strongly see the consideration there. And that one is incredibly important because you can see how culturally everything that's on social media or man, entertainment, whether it's movies or music, is, con is really trying to unravel that whole situation. Removing God from it entirely and then trying to remove all morality from it. And that would be a huge bummer for the individual to still have to pay forward the bride price but not receiving his bride. Verse 18, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. That word sorceress or sorcerer, we're gonna, we see it also in the New Testament, but this is rendered into the Septuagint when the Old Testament was written in Greek. This is where we get the word pharmakia. We can see where we use that word in today's modern language. It's pharmacy. So we have essentially three different things that's going into this one. We're moving into another section. We're introduced to, I think, three other crimes that these that are going to result in a capital punishment they will automatically bring the death sentence the first one that we see is the concept of sorcery first fellowship is supposed to be with god which leads us into the second one the aspect of sorcery is the attempt to contact or communicate or to fellowship with other spirits we do have quite a bit more to say about that one. We're going to save it for Samuel. Anybody familiar with uh, the witch that Saul had um, had sought out? We're going to cover a great deal of that in the uh, book of Samuel. But thirdly, where we get kind of that concept of pharmakia is having an altered state, an altered state with drugs. In the Greek, that word means poisoner. <laughs> poisoning with drugs, poison with something, but it's that individual trying to render someone into an alternate state. That would be uh, putting someone to death. Verse 20, the next one that's uh, deserving of capital punishment. He who sacrifices to any God except to the Lord, he shall be utterly destroyed. 
did I? Man, thank you. That is three weeks in a row. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to miss a whole chapter in the next three months. Let's back up to verse 19. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. That was kind of an interesting one, and we'll cover it again towards the end of the chapter. This law that was given to the Israelites, but it wasn't because of the Israelites. The Israelites were called to be holy. We'll see at the last verse of this chapter, they were called to be holy men. Now, we have a very wrong interpretation of the word holy. We like to think that it kind of puts us on a pedestal. Our clothes are going to be cleaner. Maybe we get our own robe with like this custom calligraphy stitched into it or a name badge or a scarf. I don't know. But we're like, oh, my goodness, look how holy that person is. Because we render it to some styles of, for lack of better words, a priesthood that are around now. But we also kind of reconcile this word with like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those that dress a very particular way. So when you saw them coming, you knew, oh, that's a righteous man. That's when he's got a great standing with God. We need to get out of his way because if his robe touches any one of us, he is now defiled and has to go through the cleansing process. That's not what holy means. Holy is a, at least in the Greek, a derivative of the word hagiai or hagios as it applies to you now. That's the word that we get, saint, as we've discussed it. But it simply means consecrated, set, afide, set, set aside or sanctified for the purposes of God. The land that they're going into, some say that there was a, a lot of worship using bestiality in Egypt. I couldn't really find anything on that. But Canaan and Mesopotamia, certainly. It was a part of some of their worship practices. So God is letting them know that's a huge no-no, and that one is going to render a capital punishment. It's going to render the death penalty. They were to be set aside. He who sacrificed to any God except to the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. We really only see this one, I think, once in the Old Testament in First Kings chapter 18, where Elijah was on the mountain with all of the priests of Baal. Remember that one, where they build their altar and all the priests of Baal are spending the whole day dancing around the altar trying to get Baal to set a fire to the altar. Nothing happens. And then Elijah prays after dumping 12 buckets of water on the sacrifice, on the offering, and God sends a fire from heaven and consumes everything. And then he has all of the priests killed. We're going to see this offense and another two of them here in the next chapter and some change that's going to bring about them being removed from Judah and into captivity. Starting in verse 21, again, how we interact with one another. You shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him. For you are strangers in the land of Egypt. People are going to know that we are Christians, that we are believers, that we are followers of Christ. People are going to know that they serve the true God by the way that not only they treat one another. It's easy to treat someone within the fellowship with a lot more respect or dignity or compassion that you know but people outside of these walls people that are not locals that's one that's been kind of a hot button these last couple of years isn't it who's moving to eastern oregon and idaho and montana i saw a bumper sticker on the freeway that made me chuckle and made me kind of sad it was a guy driving through um, with California license plates. You know, everybody's got their opinions on the things that are happening with that one. We had this bumper sticker that said, only visiting, please don't shoot me. That was his bumper sticker above his California license plate. How we treat one another certainly shows that we belong to Christ. But how we treat other people just as much shows that we belong to Christ. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way, and they cry 
at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. So we see this special care to widows and orphans, those that don't have essentially the, the father or the husband there to render the protection that they do, especially culturally at this point. This is that second thing that was prophesied to them in the prophets that brought about their, um, their desolation. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be that when he cries to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. Our compassion towards the poor. So if the poor has to do something to borrow money, God is telling them, you will not charge interest to it. He's already having a hard time, and he can't afford anything, which is why he's taking the loan. It would be a very wicked thing to do to be trying to compound that with interest. Because essentially, if you're compounding it with interest, forcing him into more and more debt, you're forcing him into a place of servitude. And likewise, on the, on the coattail of compassion, if all they have to put forward as a pledge, like I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna pay the money back or whatever the case may be, is his garment, his outer garment, the thing he uses as a blanket. If he's giving that forward as a pledge, he's gonna get things done and you keep it. Essentially the Lord is saying, well, he has no covering at night. He has nothing to keep him warm. He has nothing to sleep covering him or to sleep on. You are going to give it back to him. How we treat one another. Next, we're seen as holy or can I be identified as consecrated by how we talk? You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. That's an interesting one, isn't it? That word for God, a lot of people go back and forth with, is it talking about God or is it talking about judges? That word for God here is Elohim, the same word we've been using as judges. Either way you go, we kind of understand the concept of not reviling God. We know how important that one is, but not reviling rulers or cursing rulers of your people. That one, right now, we kind of had a really hard time with. Some of the most vulgar bumper stickers have been allowed in the last two years. Or billboards. Things that are encouraged. We see this principle in Acts, I think, chapter 23 or 25. I don't think it was that late. Um, when Paul is brought before the high priest... And Paul is kind of talking back to the high priest a little bit, and one of the guards standing next to Paul smacked him. And Paul says, God's going to smack you, you whitewashed tomb or whatever he called him. And what's the guard do? He kind of leans in a little bit. He's like, hey, what are you doing? You're reviling the high priest. And it's very unfortunate. A lot of pastors say, well, this is Paul's righteous, where's my words today? Sarcasm, a righteous sarcasm. When he says, oh, I didn't know it was the high priest. Forgive me. I don't think that's Paul's sarcasm because Paul quotes this verse. I think Paul, because we've discussed it going through some of the Pauline epistles, he probably couldn't see very well. And then we see Paul apologizing. Even the high priest that was in a place that Paul was in a few years before persecuting believers. You shall not delay, love verse 20, you shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices. The firstborn of your sons shall you shall give to me likewise you shall do with your oxen, your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days. On the eighth day, you shall give it to me. The concept of the tithe. And we know that they both in Malachi robbed God of his tithe, but also robbing God of his glory as pointed out to us in First Peter. It is quite the example giving the firstborn but also of the sons. In chapter 34, and what we'd already read for previously, we know that the sons can indeed be redeemed, but it points out a couple of things. First, it's giving the best to God. It's easier and sometimes just more comfortable giving the scraps. Tithes for the believer 
I feel is an incredibly critical thing. Though not directly commanded to the believers in the New Testament, the spiritual principle still remains. Why do I give 10%? I choose to honor God with my money because it's from him, it's his use. When I call him Lord, I don't own anything, it's his. So we honor God with that one. And two, it forces us to do what we're supposed to be doing all along. You know, we see the concept of 10%. How many of you know exactly what 10% is of your check? Now, if you're on a one, good job. <laughs> if you're on a, I don't know, like a fixed income, you're on something to where your, your checks never really change, it'd be easy. But like mine fluctuate all over the place. So what does it force me to do? Be a good steward. We have to sit down and we have to budget. We have to sit down and look at, okay, we need to do this. And we have to make sure it's the first thing we do. Why is that? Oh, man, the bills and the gas prices. Currently, I'm spending a little over $1,000 a month in gas. That's ridiculous. We want to have fun money. You know, we want to go on vacations. We want to make sure we can eat. We want to make sure we do all these things. And if you wait till the very end to do your tithes, what happens to that 10%? Turns into 8, turns into 7, turns into 2, turns into, Lord, I owe you. And we put that in the tithe. No one's ever actually put an IOU in the tithe box, but we see the kind of the principle of it. We honor God first with it. Now, is there a lot of hardship after 10% of your check? Yeah. But I choose, and we're told not to test the Lord, except in one area. What is that? With your tithe. So I choose to, and the Lord is taking care of us. So we're giving the best to God, not the scraps. Two, it reminds Israel, it reminds Israel that they are God's firstborn. Now you have to remember, Israel obviously wasn't first. There was a ton of other nations before Israel was Israel. This family line started from essentially that breaking down of the twelve tribes started from Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel the night that he struggled with the angel of the Lord but they are chosen, thus making them essentially the firstborn of the Lord. And you shall be holy men to me, consecrated. And I love even kind of the aspect that he goes into. You shall not eat meat torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. They are, this is two things. One, in Leviticus 17, they weren't supposed to eat meat that wasn't first what? Drained of all its blood. But two, what eats roadkill? What eats something that's already sitting there? Other animals are called to act different from the animals. They're called to act different from everybody else into the land they're going to. They are called to be sanctified. They were supposed to be a light and an example to the Gentile nations that they were stepping into. Chapter 23, you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. So first thing up, you shall not circulate a false report. We know kind of what that one is, circulating a false report. This is dealing now with more of the judicial system, judicial matters. So someone's going to court and they're circulating essentially this concept of a false report to kind of swing favor in the system. And we saw in Proverbs that unjust scales are an abomination to the Lord. You shall not circulate a false report. That's a hard one. We can really translate that one now. Certainly we do have people trying to swing things in the judicial system, but we'll call this one gossip. Have you ever considered the concept that there's only one way to obey this command? And what is that? To put a stop to it. Now, just keeping your mouth shut is one thing, but here's the problem. Somebody else is still talking. It is the hardest of all of the ministry that I've ever had to do. The hardest thing to do is to stop gossip. I don't think there's an easy way to do it. It's going to be awkward every single time. Because when is it that you hear gossip? It's when they bring it to you. How do you, like, okay, yep. I'm certainly not going to repeat that and we go away from the conversation. You've allowed it technically to circulate. There's only one way to obey this command, and that's to put a stop to it right there. Have you ever been in that situation? How do you resolve that one? Stop and ask them. Ask them for facts. Ask that probing question. They're going to be found out right away. And we see it kind of as this sneaky thing in the church. 
How many times we've gotten this pray? I need you to pray for someone. Oh, Susie, this is what I heard that she's, yeah, we need to pray for that person. Have you ever talked? Have you ever gone to Susie and checked on her to see what's going on? How many people did you tell to pray for before you've actually gone and talked to the individual? The only way to be obedient to that command is to truly put a stop to it and doing that by gathering facts. You won't put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness, essentially conspiring to defend the guilty. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice, kind of gathering together in that crowd, that mob mentality to try and change things, especially in favor for the wicked. Something else that's been happening a lot in the last decade. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. So just because they're poor doesn't mean you should be on his side, even if it's going against the, uh, the rich. How Rome portrayed Lady Justice was interesting. That's where we got that image where the woman was wearing a blindfold, a sword in one hand, showing swift um, for the decision to go out, and a pair of scales. Several commentators point out that in ancient, so either, I think Persian courts, everybody essentially was in the jury panel, they all had to wear blindfolds. So they couldn't be swayed in the decision based off of what the clothing was being worn by the two parties in the court system. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help with it. How you feel, this is from Guzik, how you feel doesn't determine right or wrong in the situation. This mentality here truly shows the heart of the mature Christian. We see it in Christ. We saw it in Stephen in his address in the book of Acts. Lord, forgive them. They do not know what they do. We see them praying for their enemies, and Jesus says to pray for your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Giving that to Christ. You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked, or the more literal rending thing is in ESV, I will not justify the guilty. Just because they managed to justify just as, just as if they'd never done it. To justify the wicked in a place of court, they think they've won. Just because man justifies someone that's guilty, God is not going to justify the guilty. And again, demonstrating the importance of truth, especially in the law. We saw kind of the importance of truth and solid character in the previous verses. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Such a fascinating verse. Let me kind of turn this one around on us to, I don't know, maybe spiritualize the text a little bit. For the believer, it's easy for us to condescend and to judge or to build borders against the sinner forgetting that we too were in that place of bondage. He's saying, don't, like, you know how you were in Egypt. You know how you were in that world system or that place of bondage. You were there too. So you should understand where they're at. Verse 10, love this passage. We might make it. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor of your people may eat it. And what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive groves. Six days you shall do your work. And on the seventh day you shall rest, and your ox and your donkey may rest. And the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. The Sabbath. It's always kind of an interesting thing. A lot of, And we have Christian groups now that are very hardcore about the Sabbath have to make sure we keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is that Saturday, starting Friday evening at 1800 or 6 p.m., and it goes all the way until Saturday at 6 p.m. That is the Sabbath. 
we have a great deal of individuals that are very adamant about keeping the Sabbath. And it's interesting having those conversations. Well, how much you keep the Sabbath? Well, we have our church services on Saturday. So you don't do any work on Saturday. Technically, even to the Jews, driving your car to church is work on Sabbath. But you always got to ask them, well, do you keep all the Sabbath? And when they say yes, you can ask them, so, so you keep the Sabbath year. We think of the Sabbath day, what's introduced to us here is the Sabbath year. Six years you will work. The seventh year is a sabbatical. You do no work. That's kind of a hard concept, isn't it? Why no work for a year? Two reasons. One, it puts that faith and that reliance back into God. Can you imagine a year with no work? That is a step of faith. I like the idea of not having to work for a year. But I mean, honestly, what would you do right now? If like, this is the year of the Sabbath, we're not going to do any kind of a work. As much as I like that idea, it also makes my stress level really, really, really high. Especially as we see gas prices kind of going up. So the first one is that concept of faith in God, rest in the Lord. But two, it also feeds the poor. So now we can see kind of the conundrum here. How many of us realistically can survive a year without work? Speaking strictly in the flesh, honestly, I, I don't understand. I couldn't do it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to work throughout that year. How many of us can't take off, let's say, a Sabbath? How many of us can't take off that Saturday or that Sunday? We're still kind of, we're choosing to work instead. So we're kind of robbing God there. But also not allowing the poor to eat. I need to make money. I have to do this. God is just going to understand. All the while, the poor are looking forward to that, sub, that Sabbath year because they get to eat. They get to glean from those fields. They get to bring food into their house. If you're continuing, to, if you choose to skip the Sabbath year, they don't get to do that. And a lot of people like to minimize it. Well, the Sabbath year really isn't that big a deal. Because we don't see the Sabbath year in the Ten Commandments. We see the Sabbath day in the Ten Commandments. Remember that one in Exodus chapter 20. So the Sabbath year is not really a big deal. I would encourage you into a heavier study, and it will show you otherwise. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, which I think I have time to read it. And I really should have bookmarked it first. Or had someone put it up on the screen for you. We'll start 2 Chronicles 36, verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, the prophets, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men, this being Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak, he gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Either Nebuchadnezzar or his father, Nabopolassar. I guess I just throw that in there. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, the first wave in 605 B.C., where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, verse 21, chapter 36, Second Chronicles until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. They went into captivity because they subverted justice, practiced idolatry, mistreated the poor. They went into captivity. They went into captivity for 70 years because they skipped the Sabbath year 
for 490 years. That is why they went into captivity for exactly 70 years. So now we see how important it was for them to have kept the Sabbath year. And truly as a spiritual point, though not directly commanded in the New Testament, that we are to keep the Sabbath. Paul addressed this one in the book of Romans about putting one day or one feast day above another or that all days are unto the Lord. Though we are not called specifically into a Sabbath, that day of rest, not to be confused with our gathering, but spiritually for us, it is absolutely, it is so crucial for us to just break away and spend that time with God. Not just coming here for fellowship, but it's truly just to move aside by ourselves and just spend time at the feet of Jesus, just being refreshed, spending time in word, spending time in prayer, breaking away from our televisions and our phones, just opening up our Bibles, just being on our prayer pillow and just spending that time at the feet of Christ. Verse 13, and in all that I have said to you, be circumspect, circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. Again, that heavy warning against idolatry. That heavy warning, what I really like about that passage is the word circumspect. It's got quite the definitions. Um, my favorite one is to hedge, to hedge with thorns. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Ghost in the Darkness? fascinating story the lions are stuffed i think in like britain or in chicago i there's i don't remember which one it was i know they're worlds apart but they're stuffed and they're in one of them essentially in africa especially i don't remember how long ago it was um, somewhere early in the 19th century when they had these work camps they would hedge this village this work camp with thorns have we ever gotten tangled up in uh, a russian olive tree they're not fun, but these thorns were a lot bigger than that. And they would hedge the work camp to make sure that nothing gets in there because a the lion's not going to go trying to dig through those thorns. To guard themselves from idolatry was essentially protect themselves just like that. That's a heavy concept, isn't it? If the church truly had chosen or chooses to guard themselves from idolatry, the church would look completely different. Say, so, well, pastor, like we don't worship the teraphim. We don't keep little figurines. We don't keep these little, one little trinkets that we, we worship and we pour ourselves into. Kind of true. We might not carry around our little figurines, but there are certainly something that we generally put between us and our fellowship with God. Could be a hobby. Could be work. Could be family. It could be you just want to be in a place of distraction. You've had a heavy week. You've had a heavy day. I mean, I can't, I can't wait to leave fellowship tonight and go home and kick off my shoes and turn on my television. Or what is it that stops us from coming to church? What is it that stops us from going into the Word? What is, it, what is it that stops us from going into our prayer closet or our prayer pillow? What stops us from doing that? Whatever the answer to that question is, that is your idol. If you were to put the things of God into one side of the scale and anything else into the other side, whether it's looking at your time management or your checkbook or whatever it is, your service, which side of the scale is going to drop? If it's dropping on that side, that's your idol. It could even be a function in the church. Have you really thought about that one? We spend so much time working or we're distracted by the concept of a service in the church that it becomes a duty. That instead has become your idol, even what I'm doing. If I'm doing it surely as a duty or a glory to self, that is idolatry because it has stopped me from truly coming to the feet of Christ. We should be guarding our relationship and our work with God against everything that would attempt to intercede, interdict, I guess is probably a better word for it, to stop us, to block us from getting there. Why this heavy warning right there at at least where we left off. They came out of a land rich in polytheism, many different gods. 
they're going into Canaan, that's bordering Mesopotamia, which was also very polytheistic. And they, even before Israel was Israel, you remember when Jacob and his family had decided to break away from Laban and go back south like they were commanded to do. What was the first thing his wife did? <laughs> she stole the teraphim. She stole Laban's gods because she believed it brought him good fortune and took him with her. And later they had to bury him at the terebinth tree by Shechem. Already rich with idolatry. Forty days-ish, I think, from where we are right now. Moses is going to be on the mountain. What's Aaron and the rest of the people going to be doing? Fashioning an idol, a golden calf. Because it is so easy to want something tangible to worship. That's why we saw the warnings that we did in chapter 20 and 21. See that I have spoken to you from the mountain. God had manifest himself without form. God is spirit, and likewise, we should be worshiping in spirit and in truth. No idolatry, no carved images, no engravings. Truly, we should be guarding our relationship with the Lord, with the Lord just as heavily. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this evening and blessing our time together. Thank you, Lord, for just showing us so many amazing just contrasts and parallels in your word. Thank you so much, Lord, that by your spirit you have shown us relevance. Truly, Lord, we are identified as sons and daughters by the way that we honor you and by the way, Lord, that we interact with each other. And I pray, God, that all of us, the church, the body as a whole, would certainly grow to that place of loving you with all of our heart and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. And we're very thankful, Lord, for the challenge. And we love you and we praise you. We pray.